How are you doing? I'm Beth. Uh, I am the founder of Authentically Funny Speeches. I'm a professional comedy writer who helps people with personal speeches, like wedding speeches. And to date, I've worked on about 600 of them. So I do have a sense of uh, what works, what doesn't, and why. And I really do love helping people with these. If you are watching live, go ahead and uh, let me know what kind of speech you're working on in the comments, because I can see when people are here but I can't, uh, I don't know who you are until you actually leave a comment. So I would love to see that. Uh, what we're doing for the next hour is I'm answering questions. Uh, some of you have sent questions in in advance. I'll get through those. Also, if you have a question, if you're putting a wedding speech together, just leave your question in the comments. And that way uh, I know it's there and I will get to it. Uh, also, at the end of this, uh, we'll go for about an hour, and then at the end of it, I'm going to pick the best question, and the best uh, the person with the best question is going to get a free speech audit, and that's where you send me the draft of your speech, the speech where you go, I think it's finished, I'm not sure, it's good, it could be better, and uh, I send you back a video with a whole bunch of feedback and comments and suggestions uh, on, from my end on how to make it really just absolutely perfect. So. Let me get to the first question. Is there anything else I've forgotten to say at the beginning? This is smooth. By the way, also, I'm uh, trying to not wear my reading glasses because I'm vain. So we'll see how well that works. All right, the first question that was sent in. Do you have a speech outline? Yes. Next question. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, I do have a speech outline. Uh, I've got a couple of videos that have speech outlines in them. I will make sure they're in the description if they aren't already. I know a couple of them are. Those are videos that walk you through the six sections of a great wedding speech. There's one specifically for a father of the bride speech and one for any kind of speech. For a preview, the six sections, hard to say without spitting, the six sections of a wedding speech that you really want to have in there the introduction, thanks and acknowledgments, that's kind of one thing. The uh, You talk about your half of the couple and why they're great. You talk about the other half of the couple and why they're great. You talk about why they're great together, why they make a great team, and you wrap it up with a big, fat, raise your glass, actually ask people to raise their glass, toast. And if you add content to each of those six sections, as needed, some will be bigger than others, you're going to have a speech that has a natural progression. There's a reason this story goes after that story. And you're just going to build to that big finish. So that is a speech outline. If you want uh, a little help with that, I also do have some uh, paid templates. I mean, it's basically everything that I just explained to you, but with suggestions on what kind of content will work well in each of those sections and some prompts and uh, digging questions so that you know what kind of story might do well there. Links to all that stuff are down in the description. Uh, and, oh, also here, I've, I got clever. I've got to see if I can actually point to it backwards. I've got a QR code because I'm told many people watch on their TV and that means that I don't think you can get to do this to the description if you're watching on your TV. So I have a QR code because I am have joined this century. Oh, got comments in here. Bill. Hi, Bill. Working a rehearsal speech for my son. Almost done, but it's below five minutes with the toast. I bought your speech module. Well, thank you for buying that, Bill. And thank you for joining us here. Uh, and congratulations on, on uh, your son's wedding. That'll be fun. Uh, okay, so, but below five minutes with the toast. Well, I would say that's not necessarily a problem if it's quality it, over quantity. So if you've said everything that you want to say, if there's not something that you think is missing, then five minutes is great. And it, so rehearsal speech. So you're giving it during the rehearsal dinner. I, I don't think you're in a bad situation if it's a little bit short, because no one's going to say, you know, I thought Bill loved his son. But the speech was like 4.45, so I, I don't think he loves his son. People want a speech that 
ticks all the boxes. They want one that's sort of where they get to learn a little bit about you, a little bit about your son, what you think of the new daughter-in-law or the new partner. They want to get a sense of the dynamic in your family. You know, what, what was your son like as a kid? You know, some laughs, a little, they want a little, you know, lump in their throat when you give that toast or when you give a little bit of advice or when you wrap it up. It's not about the time. It's really about the content. So if you have a specific question on something you think that's missing and you want to add it, go ahead and throw that into the into the comments as well. I'm happy to answer it. Thank you for the question. Let's see. Moving on. Okay, it's a long one. This is a test without the reading glasses. The rehearsal dinner is being hosted by the groom's parents. I'm pretty sure they'll ask me to say something, and I don't want to say something that's already in my father of the bride speech. Well, that makes sense. Uh, congratulations on your daughter's wedding. So, yeah, so I, I think this happens a lot. Uh, I, I've had that question before. So I think it's fair for you to actually be honest and say, you know, I'm giving the big speech tomorrow, so I'm not going to I don't want to let go of any of the best stuff now, or uh, I'm giving the big, big speech tomorrow, so I, I won't talk at you now. You'll you'll get all you'll get plenty of me tomorrow. Just something that kind of acknowledges that the the big the big event for you is coming up the next day. But you can certainly be gracious and say, you know, the, the big my my big speech is coming up tomorrow, so I won't take up too much time now. But I just wanted to say on behalf of and you know your wife, the family and you mentioned her by name on behalf of, of Susan and, and, and Dave and, and everyone. We're so happy to have you all here. Thank you to, and then name check the groom's parents. Thank you to, you know, Alan and Elaine for hosting this wonderful dinner. It, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you. Um, you know, may we have many more happy occasions together. Something that's very, very short and sweet, but is, is truthful. Because, um, you know, and also it gives you a chance to really thank the groom's parents for what they're doing, whether or not they are. I know sometimes that's a point of a bone of contention, uh, but it just, yeah, it's a little spot to thank people. But you can do that in a minute, something. So you don't have to, you don't have to use up your material. Okay, let's see. How do I click that? Oh, we have... This is fun, watching me work technology. And if you are just joining us, let me know in the comments, comment if you can. I realize I'm talking, I have a lot of my clientele are dads. So I realize I'm asking dads to use technology, which might not be the best idea. Um, it's just a whole bunch of angry guys of, a, you know, guys of a certain age who are frustrated with their phone going, it doesn't, she's saying to leave it in the comments, but I can't figure out how to leave it in the damn comments. Um, so I, I will, I feel you here, <laughs> whether or not you're able to, to get the technology to work. Lord knows I am struggling with it. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Be funny, but not get canceled. <laughs> um, are people sensitive now? Is that something into, in 2023? Are people sensitive about things? I don't know. That hasn't been my experience as, as a comedian. Uh, yeah, be funny, but not get canceled. Well, I think it's, it's absolutely possible to be funny without getting canceled. You have to remember where you are. This is not, you're not on stage at a comedy club for the late show. You're in front of a very mixed audience. Even if there aren't kids there, you got grandma and Aunt Yetta, you got all the people there. So you have to, you have to keep that in mind. And I, my rule is kind of when I'm writing speeches or working with people, it, it's the, the spirit of, for this, if it doesn't make everyone laugh, it's not funny. And that could also be doesn't make them laugh because it's a it's an in-joke or a specific reference that everyone isn't going to get. And also, in terms of material, there's always a way, if there's a great story and it involves something that might be 
off color or off putting. There's always a way to use a euphemism. I mean, like I said, most of you are fathers of the bride or many of you are parents. If you are, then you'll remember Johnny Carson. And Johnny Carson, an American talk show host for three decades, but he was, you know, the show's on 11 o'clock at night and he was naughty. He was very, very naughty. And he was naughty on television when you couldn't say a curse word, you couldn't talk about sex, you couldn't do this. He always found a euphemism. He always found a way around it, a way to sort of an eyebrow raise. But uh, all that said, I do generally have five things that you shouldn't mention in any wedding speech. I call them the five Ps. Profanity, poop, projectile vomiting, previous partners, and politics. So the five Ps that you shouldn't mention in a wedding speech, profanity, poop, projectile vomiting, past partners, politics. But like I said, there's always a way around things. So if you have a great story, a story that tells us something about the subject of your speech, then maybe there's a way to tell that story. I mean, the reason I have prof <laughs> poop and, and projectile vomiting on that list are because I work with a lot of best men and maids of honor, and a lot of them met the bride or the groom when they were in college, where there was a lot of drinking. But what I always try to remind them is, this is basically dinner theater. When you're giving your speech, it's basically dinner theater, right? Your People are eating, or at least they have food in front of them. So they either have just eaten or they're about to eat. So you don't want to talk about anything too gross. But so if if you're maid of honor, you know, if she's the kind of person who will hold your hair back when you're barfing, there's a better way to say it. So it's not that you absolutely can't say these things, but you just want to be conscious of how you say them and you want to make sure there's a really good reason. I mean, I say don't use profanity, but if you've got a, a great story about your son or your daughter and there's a family story that just you know, kills every time, it just absolutely is a winner, you know, and it involves when she said bleep, to a teacher or to something like that at three years old or unknowingly. Yeah, one curse word for the sake of a great story. When the punchline of the story is that one curse word, sure, go ahead. I mean, you know your audience, but to me, that's completely acceptable. But you also don't want to go up there and, and sound like you're, you know, a Marine just out of boot camp at a bar. You want to keep it generally clean. Uh, Politics? Yeah, I would say don't talk about politics. I have that as the fifth P in the sense of there's some low hanging fruit in terms of jokes. And as I kind of said, if everyone's not laughing, it's not funny. And that's not just what I think. I mean, that's not just for the sake of the audience, that's for you. If, if you have an audience, if there's 200 people sitting there watching your speech and you bring up something that is controversial or controversial and not kind of unnecessary to the speech. There's a good chance a big chunk of people out there, whatever side of the aisle you're on, are going to kind of turn off because the people that uh, don't like that person are going to think, you know, they're going to kind of dismiss you and they're going to check out a little bit. So they're really not going to be paying attention to the rest of your speech. And the people that you know, and, and the other half of the people are just going to, you know, their head's going to explode when they hear that name. Like, it's kind of a no-win situation. So when I say no politics, I don't say it because of a particular political view of mine. I say that because there's a good chance you're going to lose a chunk of the audience because people won't yell and scream or throw rolls at you. They're just going to kind of check out. They'll think, oh, this yuts. And they'll start wondering when the next food course is coming. So if you want 200 people to laugh every time you tell a joke, try to use material that makes everyone laugh, that, that is that will appeal to the broadest number of people possible. And again, that doesn't mean you can't be a little naughty. It doesn't mean you have to be boring. As you can tell, kind of feel strongly about this. Uh, okay. Oh, we got a comment. Let's see. Hey, Jeff. 
nice to see you here. Thanks for coming and, and uh, commenting. You might have said, as I joined late, what's the best way to say that I know your grandparents would have loved to be here, but I'm sure they're here in spirit. Is that a good way? Uh, yeah, that's a very good way. And the other half of that is, I don't know about you, but the other half to me of that question is usually, and how do I do it without bursting into tears? Because that, you know, that's an emotional minefield of, of mentioning people who have gone. And so, yeah, I, I think, you know, your grandparents would have loved to be here. They're, I'm sure they're here in spirit. That's perfect. A way that you can, something you can add after that to as humor to kind of relieve a little bit of that emotional tension when everyone thinks, oh yeah, oh yeah, Bubby, you know, grandma, Nana, whatever you call her, would have loved to have been here, is to say what, like, what would grandma or what would grandpa, what's a personality trait of theirs? What's something they used to say? What was something uh, not annoying that they would say or do, but what's something that, that really made them a character? So is it that, you know, grandma would have loved to have been here. I'm sure she's here in spirit. I mean, she never would have stopped telling you. I mean, she would have said, you're wearing too much makeup. You're absolutely beautiful without makeup. Why are you wearing so much? You're covering that pretty face. You know, if grandpa was here, if my dad was here, he would, you know, uh, he would have loved to have seen you as a bride. I mean, he never would have stopped complaining about the buffet, you know, or he would never would have stopped complaining that, uh, you know, we didn't have a shrimp tower, <laughs> you know, what are you trying to starve these people that you call this a, you call this a spread, you call this a buffet. Uh, Jeff, I don't know if your family is, your grandparents are Jewish, but in my mind, they are, they're, they're my family. But those are the kinds of things that you can do. Attach the thing that has a little bit of emotional heaviness to it, attach it to something that help, is a little bit lighter and also helps us to get to know that person. That way you, you've kind of got a reason for what you're doing. It, Jeff said yes. I don't know if that was to my 20 minute rant on how to make it funny or whether or not all the relatives are Jewish, but you get my name. You, you, you get the idea. It works. Whoops. Be, uh, go on. But you get the idea. It's, it's balance. So if you're going to have something in there that's emotionally charged, you kind of blow up that balloon full of tension and this goes for the whole speech. Whenever you build a lot of tension and you're worried you're going to cry or you're just worried that the speech kind of is going to go a little bit too sentimental, add some humor. And, and the humor that you add should be humor from story or humor from character, humor from truth. Nothing is funnier than real life. I mean, I, I, mean, I can tell you my folks are gone, but I can tell you you know, the sorts of things immediately, <laughs> you know, I know what my mom would have said. I know what my dad would have said. I, I know what Aunt Joan and Uncle Stan, like I, I can hear their voices in my mind and I, I'm sure you can too. Your family, not, be weird if you heard my Uncle Stan in your head. <laughs> Jeff said, yeah, Jewish. Uh, well, there, there you go. You can just directly quote. So, um, Definitely one of the relatives will be complaining that there's not enough food if you're like my family, no matter how much food there is. Like Italians, we are obsessed with food. Okay, next question. And if you're just joining us, welcome. Let me know in the chat what kind of speech you're working on. And the best question to incentivize this a little bit, the best question uh, of the stream uh, I'm going to give a free speech audit. It's uh, one of the services that I sell. That's where you you send me your the draft of your speech, and I watch it, and I give you video feedback. I send you a video, 20, you know, I say that they're 15, 20 minutes. I don't think I've done one yet that's under half an hour, because as you can tell, I kind of get started. But And I can't stop. But I will go through your speech top to bottom, and I will offer you suggestions and feedback on maybe how to reorganize it, how to tweak some of the jokes and some of the truth so they land as jokes, and how to make it just as, as heartfelt and funny as possible. 
I also have a live service where I do that. I call that the speech review and all that stuff is down in the description if you need it, or yes, it's over here. Mirror image, not good. If you're watching on a TV, you can use that QR code. Look at me, I'm, I'm like the kids with the QR codes. All right. Oh, we've got some comments. Um, Eric. Nice to see you here, Eric. Thanks for coming. Thanks for commenting. Father of the Bride, congratulations. Bill, oh, address nerves, please. So nerves. So uh, I have a video in the description. There's a link that tackles, uh, I talked to someone who is a vocal confident coach, a singer songwriter who also deals with anxiety and, and works with clients to help them get that sort of ter terrified shake out of their voice. But really the best thing to do for nerves is, is preparedness. And I know it sounds dismissive, but it really is true. The more prepared you are, that really helps with nerves. So by prepared, I mean, write a speech, keep, re keep rewriting it, keep perfecting it. And I know you're doing that. I know you've got that covered. And then practice your speech. And by practice your speech, I mean read it out loud and read it out loud as many times as you can because that's muscle memory. It's it's shooting free throws. It's just, it's literal muscle memory the same as any other sport. It's, or, or think of it as dancing. The first time you try a new step, you know, it, it's kind of awkward, but the more times you do it and the more times you do it, it just comes out more naturally. And also while you're practicing your speech, keep revising it, keep tweaking it. So if you find yourself, uh, because the best way to deliver a speech to me is to make it very conversational. So as you're reading it out loud, if it's if you feel like something's, you sound like a Hallmark card or it just doesn't sound like you, keep tweaking it, just adjust it. Cause you'll find yourself paraphrasing your speech, rewrite the speech or tweak the speech so that it's on the page the same as it's uh, coming out of your mouth. That's going to help you. When you go to print out your speech, use a big font. Sounds silly, but use a big font, 16, 18. If you use a big font and you make sure that you separate the paragraphs that you have, like have each thought be its own paragraph and have some white space around those paragraphs. So that way, when you're reading your speech, so when you're you're sitting there or standing there, you can make eye contact with people, look back down at your speech, even without your glasses. I have my stuff written so big, I haven't used my reading glasses yet, but you'll find your spot. And finding your spot makes it, because if you don't find your spot, you sort of go, uh, 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 and any momentum you've built or any confidence that you've built for yourself just evaporates immediately, even though the audience could care less. But to you, it's going to be, uh, it's going to feel like forever. So that's something that you can do for nerves. Also, don't drink too much. Like have one drink, save the drinks, the real drinks for afterwards. Make it your reward. It's a, it's a, it's a coordination thing. It's the same reason you're not supposed to drive when you drink. You feel like you do it better. You don't. So if you have to have some, a little liquid courage, have one drink, but don't have more than that. If you really want to relax yourself, go take a minute before it's time to give the speech. We'll find out exactly when you're going to give the speech from the wedding coordinator or some, you know, the, the planner, whoever it is. Know when you're going to give your speech so that you can kind of emotionally prepare for it. I mean, literally, it'll be the appetizers, then you, you know, that kind of thing. So you know when it's coming and you don't have to be sort of hyper aware. And about 15 minutes before that, just go into the lobby, go into the men's room, wherever you have to go, and just take 10 deep breaths. And it sounds silly, but you're, you really will center yourself a little bit. So hopefully that will help. More questions coming in. Oh, Jeff. Jeff is a father of the bride. Congrats, or as our people say, mazel tov. Also speak to one person who you're comfortable with. Yes, that's a great tip for dealing with nerves. So if you're, you feel like you're speaking to one person, that's going to help you. I mean, you got two people who you, at least two people there who you should feel comfortable with. That's your child. If you're father of the bride and, and the, the new partner. So speak to them if you have to now performance wise, 
try to, and this is a comedian trick, but try, even if you don't want to make eye contact with anyone, look to the four corners of the room. <laughs> I'm telling you, it helps. Just look to the four corners of the room. Every so often, look to a corner of the room. Now, it's also going to be much better if you can make eye contact with the bride and groom or whoever it is that you're talking about. But just as a general note, if it, you're addressing something to the audience, you're sharing just general information with them, look, just try the four corners of the room or, you know, left corner, middle, back, front, front, side. It's what comedians do. Because professionally, when someone's on stage, when someone's on stage in a comedy club or on in a theater, there's a light in your eyes. You can't see the audience. Maybe you can kind of see the front row, but that's about it. So when you see a comedian doing this and it looks like they're really talking to people, it looks like they're really making eye contact. I can tell you, I spent 15 years as a stand-up comedian. Can't see anyone. It's all made up. It's just smoke and mirrors. So create the illusion of talking to people. Okay, another question from Eric. Okay, uh, as a deacon who preaches every month, oh, cool, um, preaches every month, who is not a natural speaker, Beth is right spot on. Thank you, Eric. Uh, practice your speech so much you know it inside and out. Plus, you can't speak too slow. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Eric. Thank you. It, it's, well, first of all, Eric does this every weekend and doesn't feel like a natural speaker. So, I mean, I'm going to guess that Eric's, would it be parishioners? Or the people that Eric is speaking to probably think he's a natural speaker. So it doesn't matter how you feel inside. If you project that air of confidence, if you project that air of knowing what you're doing, then you'll be in great shape. And yeah, practice your speech so much that you know it inside and out. You don't have to, you don't have to memorize your speech. I know people really, I mean, it's one of the questions I get most often, but to me, I don't think you have to memorize your speech. I don't think it gets you anything. All it does is, is it makes you focus on remembering your speech when you're up there, but you shouldn't be focused on remembering your speech when you're up there. You should be focused on delivering your speech and connecting with your audience because that audience is, you know, in this, in many of these cases, your child or your best friend or your sibling. So, don't distract yourself by trying to remember it. Do that work beforehand. Print out your speech, wander around the house, sit in the car. Well, maybe don't read it while you're in the car, but talk to the dog, whoever you have to read the speech to, because you don't need an audience for it. Read it to the wall, the cat, whoever you need to, but just read it. And you'll have that muscle memory and you will find that your speech is about 60, 70% memorized. And that's about it. Because no one, if someone sees you going up to, to give your speech and they see notes in your hand, they don't think, well, couldn't take the time to memorize it. He probably doesn't love his daughter. No, they're going to think, oh, thank goodness, someone who's not going to ramble <laughs> like, I, like I've been doing. But that's what they're going to think. They are going to be thrilled that you are, that, that you're prepared because that it's, it, it, they will feel as if they're in good hands and that makes them a great audience because they, they don't have to worry that it's going to be one of those speeches. And there you go, Eric, uh, I'm with you. And, and have it all written out, 16 font, a lot of breaks at important spots. Yes, absolutely. Let's go to another question. Does anyone else see the fly in here? There's a fly that just keeps going by. Oh, for someone with ADD, that is very challenging. Okay. Um, okay, we kind of kind of covered this, but let's give it a little something else. Uh, my mother was close to my daughter and has passed on. I want to mention her in my speech, but I know I will tear up, and I don't want that to be what people remember in my speech. Well, I'm I'm sorry that your mom has passed on. Beautiful that you want to mention her during the speech, if especially you know, uh, your daughter's going to love that too. It's a matter of balance. So what will help you is after you mention her and you talk about 
how close they were. Maybe you have an example of how close your your mom and your daughter were that, that has some humor to it. Uh, was there some time that, you know, gee, they were really close and they did this together and that together. But there was that one time when my daughter, you know, when she broke grandma's glasses or she, you know, she always knew what, what did your daughter do that sort of irritated your mom you know, as a little kid? Or what did your mom, what did your mom uh, not criticize, but what did she wish your daughter would have done differently in a fun way, maybe a generational difference? You can also talk about your mother, uh, what would your mom have said or done or been drinking? What was her drink of choice? Uh, you know, I know my mom would have, if it were my mom, I would have said she would have been so happy to have been here. She never would have stopped telling you how beautiful you are and how, how much she loved you and how happy she was that you found Dave. Uh, and she would have been doing it all with a glass of very nice wine with some very cheap ice cubes in it. You know, something like that. What is it that you can add that's truth, but is, is kind of, you know, adds a smile. And that's what's going to diffuse the tension of that emotional moment with a different emotion, laughter. Let's see here. Eric B., how long should a father of the bride speech be? Uh, I usually recommend about five minutes. And that is, that's actually a goal for when you're writing your speech, aim for five minutes. So your speech doesn't have to be five minutes, but when you sit down to write it, I usually suggest aiming for about five minutes. It's always quality over quantity, but I divide speeches up into six sections generally. I mean, it's a great starting point for an outline. And the six sections are introduction. So it's who are you? And, and how are you feeling about being up there? Because just saying, hey, I'm the, the bride's dad. Okay, you can do a little better that, than that. I'm the bride's dad. And um, you know, I'll try not to embarrass you up here. I, I'll embarrass you later when I do this. Or I won't embarrass you by telling people about the time that you did this. You know, something like that. Or I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this without crying. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I've been crying since, uh, well, about three weeks ago. It is just something that gives us a little more. So uh, introduce yourself and tell us how you're feeling. Then thanks and acknowledgments. Thank anyone who needs to be thanked, like your wife. And also acknowledgments, that's where you'd put something for anyone that's passed on. Then that's when you go into detail about your half of the couple and why they're great. Then the other half of the couple and why they're great. Don't forget the other half of the couple. Then uh, the fifth section is why they're great together. Why do they make a great team? What do you wish for them in the future? Do you have any advice for them? If you're a parent and you've got 30 years of marriage under your belt, what advice, what do you wish you'd heard on your wedding day? What have you learned? And the sixth section is just usually the shortest part, but that's just a great big raise your glass, actually ask people to raise their glass, toast. And if you put about a minute into each of those six sections, you know, the intro and the toast usually end up being a little bit shorter. You got a speech that's about five minutes. But it's not about the time. If your speech ends up being longer, but you've trimmed out all the fat that you can, but you've made it as, you, but you, you, you've made sure that every story, everything that you say serves a purpose. You've made sure that you're not repeating something. It's just, with a different story because some dads will just go through and, and go from, well, uh, just from conception right up until that day. It, 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 you don't have to talk about every single moment that has passed in her life. You just want to have the highlights. Your speeches, if you make it really efficient, if you trim the fat, your speech is what your speech is. I mean, that said, when you're getting close to 10 minutes, it's just a long time, and other people are going to be speaking. If the maid of honor and the best man are giving speeches, if your wife, wife is speaking, I mean, if everyone went 15 minutes, you know, that's a hostage situation. People are drinking. They're going to need to pee. Other things need to happen in the wedding. So keep that in mind. But have a number to aim for when you are writing your speech. I think a good number to aim for is five minutes. Oh, five minutes. 
is about a page and a half double spaced in a normal font, in a 12 point font. So you'll have a sense that you're getting to five minutes. Also, generally people tend to speak around 150 words a minute. So if you use, if you're using Microsoft Word, you can go up to tools and word count. You can actually count how many words are in your draft. So 750-ish is about five minutes. So it just gives you a ballpark where you are. Thank you for your question. And if you're just joining us, uh, go ahead and uh, let, let me know in the chat, in the comments, what kind of speech you're giving. And if you have any questions about your speech, that's what this live stream is for. Put them in the comments. If you are watching this on replay, still put it in the comments. I will still come in. I'll keep an eye on it. I get notified and I will be happy to answer your questions in the comments. And if you need, if you need a little more help, uh, this is the shameless plug section. I do one-on-one -on -one consultations with people. You can book me for an hour or you can just send me your speech and I'll give you feedback. I've got all kinds of templates. A few people in here said that they've already uh, purchased templates. I have all of that information down in the description or also, nope, other hand. Also, uh, if you're watching on the TV, you can get to uh, my shop, authentic, my website, authenticallyfunnyspeeches.com through that QR code or just by typing in authenticallyfunnyspeeches.com and you'll find all the ways I can help one-on-one -on -one with your speech. There's Jeff, need to head out. I did appreciate the packet. Uh, I did purchase the package, appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for asking great questions. I really appreciate it. And thank you for buying the template. All right, let's move on. Let's do some more questions. Oh, if I'm, well, just a YouTube-y thing, if, if you're finding this helpful, throw me a like. Just hit the like button. It helps YouTube find this for other people. And uh, it, it helps me out a bit. Okie doke. Next question is, ah, what happens if you're divorced? How to acknowledge her mom? Yeah, I, I do get a lot of clients who come to me for one-on-one -on -one stuff um, about, because there's an ex or there's some sort of uh, minefield with with past partners. So yeah, you, you should definitely acknowledge her mom. I mean, take the high road. I always think the best way to do it is at the top that in in that second section because we kind of went through the six sections. In that second section, the thanks and acknowledgments, you know, thank her mom for doing a great job. Hopefully she has. However you two get along or don't get along, if your daughter's getting married and you're pretty happy with who she's marrying, you together, one way or another, you, you both did a pretty good job. So just take the high road. You don't have to spend a ton of time on it, but when you're thanking people, try to and, and try to give her a good position in the thanks, which is, you know, don't thank, you know, don't sort of give her a tiny thanks and then thank make a big deal about the caterer and the wedding planner and the photographer and you know, and everybody else. Something just along the lines of, you know, uh, there are so many people in so in you know whatever your daughter's name is, so many people in her life, so many wonderful people in her life. Um, but thank you, especially you know, thank you to grandma and grandpa, and and especially you know to her mom, uh, you know to to Sarah's mom, Kathy, Kathy. I mean, you know, you're just a wonderful mom, as evidenced by um, where we are today. Just anything you can say that is an olive branch. You take the high road. Don't make things more difficult. I got a draft from one guy who said, I'd also like to thank my ex. And he meant it as a good thing. He was just sort of trying, I guess, to describe to the other people, you know, to the other people in the audience who she was to him. But ex just sounds harsh. Be better to say Sarah's mom. Kathy, you know, thank you for being such a wonderful mom to Sarah. Uh, you know, you don't have to spend much time on it. Just be diplomatic, even if it's horrible between you two. Because if it's not good between you two, and it and probably maybe wasn't hasn't been good for a while, people are going to be a little clenched. People are going to be a little worried about what you're going to say. And actually, even if they're not, if your daughter is worried about what you're going to say or how it's going to come up or how it's going to come out of your mouth, 
really put a lot of thought into making it as diplomatic, as kind, and if you have to, relatively as short as it can be. Because you really, you just want your daughter to have a good day. You don't want her to be worried about it, and you don't want to throw gasoline on the fire, even inadvertently. Whoop. Got a comment. Let's see here. Oh, poker chipping chair. I, I, I like that. I like that YouTube name. Uh, I just went through this process on July 8th. Oh, thank you for your six points. Uh, I wish I'd found you sooner before I walked my daughter down the aisle. Thank you. Name's Bill. Well, Bill, Bill, thank you for being a viewer. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching the videos in the past. I wish we had found one another sooner, but I'm sure you did a fantastic job. Uh, actually, let me know. Uh, drop a comment and let me know how it went. Let me know what you wish you'd known. Is there? Do you have any advice for, for the other dads that are in, in the chat? Because I can tell you, most of the people that are in here right now, they're other dads. So if you have any wisdom you can share besides, uh, you know, working with a middle-aged lesbian to help you with your speech. But uh, yeah, if you've got any wisdom that these dads should hear, share it. Please do. But uh, congrats, and I'm sure you did a great job. Because really, you know, the thing that trips people up, and it sounds silly, it sounds obvious, but it's just not being prepared. Because people think, oh, I speak all the time, I speak off the cuff, I'm, it's fine. And it's hard in that moment. I do this for a living. I've written hundreds and hundreds of speeches. I've been a comedian. I write for award shows. Like I write for and have written for some of the top names in comedy. I couldn't wing it. I could go up and give an okay toast, but it's still not going to be the same toast that I could give if I sat down for an hour and just put my thoughts on paper. If I added a little structure, if I made sure that I knew how I was going to start and how I was going to end, I don't think I could wing it. And, and make it worthwhile and make it worth the occasion. Cause this is, you know, it's, it's someone's wedding. It's, it's either, and someone that you love or at least loves you, you know, it's your kid or your best friend or your brother or your sibling. So put some time into it. I don't think I have to tell anyone here to put some time into it, but YouTube people, you know, people, random viewers, please put some time into it. Just be prepared. Any time that you take to prepare, it's going to make it better. Let's get through some more questions here. And if you're just joining us in the chat, I write wedding speeches. I'm a TV comedy writer and I write, I ghost write wedding speeches. I help people with wedding speeches. And on this channel, I've got tons of tutorials and tips and tricks on how to write wedding speeches. If you want one-on-one -on -one help, you can find that in the description. But right now, this is a live stream. And for an hour, I'm just answering questions about how to write, how to give a great wedding speech, one that's heartfelt and funny. So if you've got a question, if you're preparing a wedding speech, or if there's something that you just hate seeing in wedding speeches, maybe you're not giving a speech. Maybe I just popped up somehow. If you hate something in particular in a wedding speech, let us know that. Drop it in the chat. Leave it as a comment. Okay. To the next question. Let's see. Did that, did that, did that. Mm-hmm. Advice for Maid of Honor song. Well, I would say one of the keys to good comedy, it's a great trick for creating comedy, you're not creating comedy, just seeing what comedy is out there and using it, is self-awareness. Be aware of how you come across to other people. I'm using it myself. I just made a joke about, yes, go come get advice from a middle-aged lesbian on how to write your daughter's wedding speech. But So that's self-awareness. I am aware that I'm not who you would expect to see. If you're doing a maid of honor song, some self-awareness might be that self-awareness is what are people thinking when they're seeing you or hearing you. And it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's just acknowledging the obvious. So self-awareness in the case of a song for a maid of honor speech might be uh, people might be concerned because it's hard to do one of those. It's hard to execute well. A lot of people want to try to do them, but sometimes they don't always hit the mark. So acknowledging that somehow, having a sense of humor about that, 
if you're going up and say, you know, we really wanted to take this seriously and, and we thought and we poured our hearts into it. I mean, something where uh, that would be sort of misdirection, where you set it up as if it's one thing, but it turns out to be another. If, uh, for a Maid of Honor song, probably, you know, really, really put your time into it. Really make it good. Make it worthwhile. Because what's funny on the couch, and I can tell you this as someone that did stand-up comedy for a long time, what's funny on the couch or in the car or in the shower, it, it it's different when you're in, you have a higher bar when you're in front of an audience. You know, what makes your friends laugh when you're just kind of being silly, it's a higher bar when you're asking people at a wedding or at a public event. So make sure you put that kind of time into it. Make it really good. If you're not sure, maybe shorter is better. A parody, a song parody, so where you're basing it, you're just changing the words of a song can really help you. If you really want to make it strong, go ahead and see if you can get in touch with, uh, we'll talk to the wedding planner, maybe. Even if you want it to be a surprise, but if you're the maid of honor, you'll probably know who the wedding planner is. Reach out, reach out to the wedding planner so that maybe that wedding planner can put you in touch with the band or the DJ to make sure there's a track and make sure maybe, maybe before people come in to the, to the venue, to the hall, or, you know, cause usually there's a drinks thing and then people come in, maybe you can coordinate with whoever's doing the music or the sound to rehearse it or block it, you know, just kind of get, okay, you'll do this. And then, so, so no one's learning on the fly. That's going to make it better. So yeah. If you have a great idea for a song, go ahead and do it. Just make sure it can be the best it can be. And if you write the whole thing and you're sitting there and you, you're you not totally confident in it, and by that I mean you're always going to have nerves, but if you're not totally confident in it where you think, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, I'm not sure this is good enough, be self-aware enough, be honest enough with yourself to say, I think I'm just going to do a straight speech or, or a funny speech, you know, take the best stuff out of the song and make it, just make it a speech or a toast. And if you decide to do the song, go out and give it 110%, just absolutely go out and sell it. That would be my advice for a maid of honor song. Hopefully that was the question. Hopefully you weren't just asking me to sort of freestyle rap a maid of honor song. I need to have a lot more alcohol before I do that. We've got a comment. Hi, Eric. <laughs> Eric V says, I watched a lot of other Father of the Bride speeches and have shamelessly stolen stuff I liked and adapted it to my situation. Any pitfalls to that? Well, make sure you search through and you've changed all the names. Um, you know, make sure you've really gone through the fine tooth comb and made sure that you've adapted it completely. I know it sounds silly, but when people send me speeches to edit, there have been times where I've said, oh, who's Nigel? <laughs> and, you know, because they've just sort of transcribed something or they've just literally stolen because there's a million on the internet. They've just kind of stolen a speech. So I I'm ha only half joking when I say, make sure that you've gone through it and that you're using the best parts. I would also say, look, there's nothing wrong with being inspired by other things, but a lot of the stuff that's out there, you know, people have heard it before. And one of the things about comedy is, well, the only thing about comedy, the thing that makes comedy work is the element of surprise. So if people have heard it before, if they hear your setup and they know what the punchline is, and I see that in a lot of first drafts of Father of the Bride speeches that I get to, to work on. You just won't get as hard a laugh. You'll get a polite laugh. You'll get a respectful laugh. They love you. They like you. You're paying for dinner. <laughs> so they're going to react, but they're not going to react sometimes as strongly to something that they've heard before in one form or another. They're just not going to. You know, it, it's just, it's going to be a softer reaction. So I would say, by all means, take stuff that inspires you or take stuff that gives you placeholders for other jokes, but do your best to make it your own. 
And truth is funny. Just for everything that you say about your daughter or your son or, or whoever's involved in it, try to think of specific examples. Specificity is funny. So try to, don't just say she's got, she would do anything for anyone or, you know, don't just, that she gets hangry. Give us an example of a time she got hangry. Because <laughs> those are funny. You, you know, if, if she's high maintenance, and you're, you're making a joke about sort of the dynamic between her, uh, your daughter and, and her, well, will be her new husband by that point. If it takes her forever to get out of the house, give us a specific example of you and the whole family waiting for her to get out of the house, you know, waiting for her to finish getting ready, something like that. So by all means, steal things for your first draft. I mean, that's what the templates are. I'm, I'm giving you stuff to steal. I, I sell speech templates that are basically Mad Libs for these speeches. So instead of asking you for a noun or verb, I, I have prompts for a, maybe a story about a time when something like this happened or what was the first time, tell me about the first time you met this person, those sorts of things. But the connective tissue that's in those templates, those are jokes, they're original jokes that I wrote, but you would be delivering, you know, you would be taking a joke from me, but I'm happy if you can beat that. It's in there so you can have a solid first draft. So that would be the pitfall. It's only that you could end up with something that isn't as strong as it could be. But for a first draft, anything that gets you through a first draft, do what you got to do because the magic is in the rewriting, but you can't edit, you can't rewrite what you haven't written yet. So that's, um, there is a fly that keeps going by. I'm telling you, I hope other people see it. I hope it's not just some sort of weird episode I'm having. Okay. We can do a few more questions. Is there anything that I'm forgetting? Well, if you have a question, put it in the, in the comments, put it in the chat. It's all the same thing. At the end of this, I'm going to give away a speech audit to the best question. So uh, make sure that you leave it in there if you wanna be considered for that. I'm looking through this list of questions that people have submitted, but I'm not wearing my reading glasses, so it's a little bit more challenging. Uh, okay, we have a meet and greet after. So after the toast, how do we close out to start the movement to the greeting line. Ah, okay. So um, yes, I remember the context of this. So these are parents who are giving a speech together and I guess they're gonna give a toast and then afterwards it's gonna be the meet and greet. How do we close out to start the movement to the greeting line? So you don't, okay, so you probably don't wanna say, um, Well, I, I would do that. I would give that information before you do the toast. So I would say, um, and before we go, as soon as we finish this, would you all please join us and then give whatever directions you need to give or instruction you need to give? Um, because we want to have a chance to, you know, please go over there or whatever you're going to do because we want to have a chance to, to, you know, just give you a hug and a kiss and tell you how happy we are you're able to join us. And we're, we're looking forward to that. So now, would you all please join us? I think just something like that, you join it, you know, raise your glass. Would you all please join us in a toast to, to the bride and groom or to the future bride and groom if it's happening the next day? So doing it just beforehand, so as a before we go or we'll end on this or something like that, if you do it there, that means when you do the toast, you can do the, the raise your glass toast and da -da 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 -da. would you all please, you know, health, happiness and uh, laughter and, you know, yeah, we'd be very happy to Dave and Sally. And you have that moment and everyone cheers because it, it's kind of an applause moment. People will cheer and whoop and they'll do their drink. And then you can leave on that high point and people already know what's supposed to happen afterwards. Because otherwise, what happens is you have to sort of go, oh, hey, yeah, congrats, yeah, woo! And then you have to stand there 
until everyone is finished whooping and cheering and you're kind of stepping on your own moment. So do it just beforehand and, and then you're all good. That's a, that's a great question. That happens. It's, that's actually something that I always, um, that's something that I always tell officiants because I, I also write, um, write the ceremonies because people will come to me because they've been asked to officiate the ceremony and there's usually instructions. There's business at the end of it, you know, the bride and the groom or the, the, the couple, they're going to go have a few minutes to themselves and we want, they're going to go that way and we want all of you to go that way. So I always suggest doing that before they do the big pronouncement. Because if you do, you know, but bride and groom and everyone cheers and no one hears anything. You're, you're competing against your own reaction. You know, you're competing against your aid to get, get heard. So do it second to last, and then you can end on your high note. Oh, wow. We're, we're pretty much at an hour. We have, uh, we have, let's get through. There's another few questions that I am trying to power through with my 50 year old eyes. Okay. Um, here we go. Our son is getting married in just over a month. Congratulations. Our son is getting married in just over a month. If you have any specific tips for couples delivering speeches together, we would love to hear them. I do. I do have specific uh, tips for couples uh, delivering speeches together. If you are giving a two-person person speech, well, if two of you are going to be standing up there, it's a two-person speech. And if it's a two-person speech, so if two people are standing up there, two people must speak. They don't all have to speak a lot, but if you're both going to stand up there, please both say something. I, I see so many speeches on YouTube where they go up as a couple and dad speaks. There's nothing wrong with dad speaking, but dad speaks and mom stands there. And as an audience member, I'm thinking, is she going to say something? I mean, it starts to look like... Um, with the magician's pen and teller, <laughs> it just starts to look like that. Or, or, um, Stan and Ollie, uh, it, it starts to look like that. So you wonder, does she speak? <laughs> does she have the ability to speak? So if you've got two people going up there, you don't have to divide it in half equally. If you don't want to, often one person does not enjoy public speaking and the other kind of doesn't mind or is an absolute ham. That's fine. But if if, if you have it, if it's kind of out of balance, then have the person who doesn't want to speak much, have them do the welcome, have them do the first part, have them do the first, you know, we're so happy to have you all here today. Have them do that intro and the, you know, those first two second sections, the intro and the thanks and acknowledgements. And then I'll, I'll let Dave take over from here, but have, that person do something. So they're not just standing there silently next to the other person the entire time. I'm telling you, look at the speeches on YouTube and you will see it happen all the time. And it really does look like Penn and Teller. So I'm just standing there nodding. And then you think, well, did you have to be up there? But I would rather, rather than telling someone to sit down, I'd rather they do just, just do the straight business. Just do the, the absolute bare minimum. Welcome people. If you're not comfortable as a public speaker, all you're doing is saying to your friends and family and the people who love you and your child, or yeah, in this case, your child the most, you're just welcoming them. And I would assume those are things that you actually feel. So do that. Um, if you're splitting up the speech and you are speaking kind of an equal amount, see if you can do, well, if anyone's ever watched an award show and seen two people do bad patter, you see that it's harder than it looks when Meryl Streep can't get a laugh on patter. Um, try to not do it every other line kind of thing. Probably have one person do a chunk and then have the other person do a chunk. So either make it kind of one person speaks and the other person speaks if you're kind of dividing it equally or one person speaks, you know, or sort of A, B or A, B, A, B is a good way to divide it. You don't want to go back and forth too many times because then it becomes a little, you have to focus a little bit more on this kind of, you know, then you're kind of doing a routine and you have to focus a little bit more on your timing and stuff. And whenever you're focused on that, you're less focused on your delivery and the people that you're trying to connect with in the audience. So 
that would be my advice to you. I'd also try to have some very obvious cues when it's time for the other person to speak. Like, and then this happened, but I'll let Dave tell that story. That is a cue for Dave to start speaking, for your husband to start speaking. Or, well, that's, you know, Harriet should really tell that one. Or I'll, I'll let Harriet tell you all about the first time we met so-and-so. That's a cue. And that just make, one, it'll make it sound more natural instead of the two of you doing your kind of double act, which I don't think you're going to do, but that's sometimes how it can come across when it doesn't go well. So if you have something conversational that gives us a reason that we're switching from one person to the other, and you don't have to overthink it, you literally be, well, you know, I, I want to tell you, um, just did this in a speech uh, for a, a couple that was speaking together and they'd been together 35 years. And you know, I want to give you the most, the most important thing I've learned about marriage over 35 years is to let your wife tell people what's important. Just something like that. You know, give it a reason to, to swap. So I hope that helps. And by the way, if you're watching this and you're finding any of this advice helpful, hit the like button. It helps, at, or hit the subscribe button. Hey, do both. But it all helps YouTube. It gives YouTube signals that people are finding this useful, and it means they're going to serve it up to other people who are looking for help on wedding speeches. And we've got a comment. Uh, Poker Chip and Chair. I love that name. I do like saying that name. Dads, definitely do not forget to bring your thoughts on paper. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you wear readers, be careful looking up at her and then back to your notes. I kept losing my place. Oh, gosh. You're going to get emotional. <laughs> Accept it. Yes. Yeah, so this is uh, this dad. Uh, he, we had a comment from him earlier. He said that he gave his speech a, a, a few weeks ago. And I congratulated him and said, Please, if you have any advice for other dads, anything that you would have learned, uh, anything you think would have been helpful to know before you gave your speech, please share it in the chat. And, and he did. Thank you for sharing it. Yes. So this is from a, a veteran. This is a father of the bride speech veteran. So listen, this is wisdom. Dads, definitely do not forget to bring your thoughts on paper. Yes. Don't try to memorize it. Dads, don't be a hero. You, you really don't need it. You don't get It's not a Broadway show. It's not... It, 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 there's no expectation that you've memorized it. So unless you memorize things all the time, you're very comfortable doing it, it's unnecessary. People are fine if you come up and bring notes. All that does is tell them that they're in good hands and someone took the time to prepare. So it's fine to bring up notes. Use a big font in those notes. Here's something else. Number your pages. Number your pages. Because if you have a handful of notes or cards, I'm telling you, it's Murphy's Law. If you drop them or move them around or go to make a change on one of them and you don't put them back in order, you're going to, it'll throw you. So just, I mean, how easy is that? Just write a number on them. If you wear readers, uh, be careful looking up at her and then back to your notes. I kept losing my place. So a way to help that is again, to have it be really big font. And then also make every thought its own paragraph. So that way there's a lot of white space on your page. So if you've got a big font and a lot of white, white space on your page, when you look down, it, it, it's going to be easier to separate the thoughts. If you look down and it just looks like the back of a medicine bottle or the back of a prescription bottle, you know, and, it, and it's just dense text and it goes on forever, you will never find your place. So yeah, that is, that's a great note. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite part from the grizzled veteran uh, of the father of the bride speech. You're going to get emotional, accept it. I don't know if I can say that better. You're going to get emotional, accept it. These are emotional speeches. Yeah. Don't worry about crying. W what's the stakes? What people are going to think you love your daughter? How dare they? How dare they? D does that make it? So you're going to get emotional the way all you can control is, is you want to balance it. You want to give yourself a joke and it doesn't have to be a haha -ha joke. It can be a joke of truth. You know, tell a funny story, um, say something about yourself that's funny or how often you've been crying. Give us a funny example of something. You know, if you're talking about, you're just the best daughter and I, I couldn't have be prouder to be your father 
give us the other side of that. Although sometimes, you know, there was that time that the police brought you home because you, you know, or though there was the time that you uh, sideswiped a mailbox, I was less proud that time. You know, is there a story that you can add on? Is there something that you can add on to that really emotional moment for yourself so that something that is definitely going to choke you up, you just, you have that, you release a little bit of that emotional tension with something that's funny. True. Make it true. So you're also giving us a story. You're telling us more about the subject of your speech. It has a purpose. But that laugh is going to give you a chance to reset. And it's going to give the audience a chance to reset. Because no one, you know, it, it's the difference between you kind of getting choked up a little bit and being able to go, oh, wow, this is harder than I thought. <laughs> And you just absolutely, totally losing it and, you know, sobbing like a toddler who's, who's melting down because they didn't have a nap. So, yes, absolutely wonderful advice. Thank you for adding that. Uh, Eric B. asks, is it best to make sure you have something to put your notes on, a stand of some kind? Yeah. I, I mean, if, if a little recon, you know, be prepared. So a little recon is going to be helpful. So if you feel like, you know, you've got reading glasses and you'll have a, a champagne glass and you've got your notes with you and you don't want to be juggling everything, then yeah, see if you can get a stand. I mean, it's a, there's always going to be something. Just look the day of the wedding or during the run through or the walk through, whatever you're doing with the, the wedding planner, just ask ask, is there, will there be somewhere I can put stuff down? And if they're not sure, if the person can't give you an answer, say, I would like something. I would like to make sure that there is a place for me to put things down. Because it can also just be a chair, right? Someone could just move a chair next to it and you can just put stuff down on the chair. It, it doesn't have to be super complicated. If you've got a band up there, there's probably a stand or something or a stool. Just make sure you don't need it, but if you think you might need it, look at the space where you're going to be giving the speech and have someone put something there for you. It doesn't have to be like a formal lectern or something, a chair, a stool, something that's floating around. But if you can get someone to do that beforehand also so that you don't have to go up there holding, you know, a drink, your glasses, your notes and dragging a, dragging a chair, like you're about to do some sort of, uh, weird dance number. So uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, if you feel more prepared, let me know in the chat. Do you feel more prepared? If you found this helpful, hit the like button. If you'd like to get one-on-one -on -one help from me, go to authenticallyfunnyspeeches.com. I've got links to that and all the services and products that I offer in the description. You can also go to, you can use a QR code there with your phone if you're watching on your TV. Thank you so much for joining me. I I've had a lot of fun. I hope you have too. And uh, I'll see you next time.